Hello, it's Kyle Wilson, founder of Jim Rohn International and your success store. And today, wow, it's my great honor to be interviewing, hard to believe, my 26-year friend, the iconic Les Brown. Les Brown's one of the world's greatest speakers, motivators, inspirers. Uh, he had his own TV show. He's been part of Congress, believe it or not. He, uh, uh, he's a phenomenal author, but he's best known for being the, you know, just one of the great speakers of all time. So Les, it's an honor to have you. Thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored and thrilled for us to be able to spend some time together. It's been a long time. So it has. this is the time that you want to spend time with people that you know and admire and feel a special connection with. And I do feel that with you. Les, it's, it's so good. Are you in New York today? Or are you in Los Angeles? I'm in Atlanta. This is where Atlanta. I live. So I'm in oh, Atlanta. wow. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, hey, you had a, uh, you're, you're such a inspiring story. You know, talk about uh, having two mothers, right? Growing up uh, under some very tough circumstances. Do you mind just beginning with that, telling us a little bit about your story? Well, I always say to audiences that I'm on stage because of two women. One gave me life, the other one gave me love. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother. And, and my adopted mother just was such an incredible force of, of goodness and love in my life. She is my reason for being and she has inspired me to do so many things that I had no idea that I could do, but things because I wanted to do for her, it took me outside of my comfort zone. And as you know, in order to do something you've never done, you have to become someone you've never been. So she has been the driving force for my success. So some of those early hardships and challenges, uh, you know, some of the early labels, how did that later serve you? Well, it didn't serve me at the time. I, my mother did not understand it, the negative impact it had when I was labeled educable, mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And then I fell again in school in the eighth grade. Uh, she taught me that sticks and stones can break your bones and words can never hurt you, but words can hurt you very deeply. She did not know that, but I had a, a defining moment when I was a junior, met a guy, had a similar personality like yours by the name of Leroy Washington. And I went in his classroom looking for a good friend of mine. And he said, young man, come, I want you to work this problem out for us before the class. He wanted me to read a script. And I said, I can't do that, sir. And he said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. I said, I, I can't. And the other students started laughing saying, he's DT, he's, Leslie, he's got a twin brother, Wesley. And he said, what's DT? And they said, he's the dumb twin. Hmm. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that was a turning point in my life. Um, on one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is, he only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be, then he becomes what he should be. And I followed him around. I adopted him as my spiritual father. I, I wanted to be like him. He was a great orator and instructor and I admired his style. And I just watched him and studied him for the year that I was in school. I was never one of his students, but I followed him and I think I learned more from him than all the thousands of students he taught. Wow. Do you think that was a turning point for you? Was that a... Well, that was a major point because how people live their lives, as you're aware, is a result of the story they believe about themselves. And so when we speak, uh, we distract, dispute, and inspire. We distract them from their current story through the execution of our presentation with our knowledge and things that we've experienced and gone through we dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to become, as Mother Teresa would say, a pencil in the hand of God and start writing a new chapter with their lives. Wow. And you've got to watch that happen throughout your career, right? Yeah. So telling how many testimonials you've received. I'm curious, 
what led to you eventually becoming a speaker? There were, there were some, uh, you were a DJ at one time, you served uh, in Congress. In Ohio, no, I was in Ohio legislature. Yes, legislature. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. And I know you had the, the PBS special that really yes. I got a call one off. day when I was just elected my third term and my sister asked, Leslie, are you sitting down? And I asked, what's wrong with mama? And she said, mama has breast cancer and it doesn't look good. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. And they said, wait a minute. And my brother was on the phone too, said, look, you just got reelected. I said, listen to me, I will be there tomorrow. And then they interrupted me and said, have some good nursing homes in Dade County. I said, I don't care. And I hung up and I promised my mother that she'll never end up in a nursing home. She took us in as foster kids and then she adopted all of us and raised us by herself. So I remember knocking on the door and a friend of hers, Miss Mildred, was there, and she came to the door. She said, oh, my God. She said, Mamie, Leslie's here. And I heard my mother say, I knew he would come. I knew my boy would come. And then I had Mama's stuff all packed up. I said, unpack all of that stuff, Mildred. I'm here now. There's a new sheriff in town, <laughs> and I will take care of her. <laughs> and I did. Mama passed at 89. She was an incredible woman. So I used wow. to have a talk show. I would end it by saying, this has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. And everybody in the neighborhood called me Mamie's boy because our personalities were so similar. I was just like her. You know, uh, we met in 1994. And I remember it vividly. I was Jim Rohn's representative. Uh, he was my partner. And I remember you coming to my offices. And you had a, a TV show and you were talking about maybe us working together. And uh, uh, I remember we went out to dinner with Gladys Knight and Billy mm-hmm. Preston. Yes. And, uh, that's why, you know, what an incredible opportunity, 1993, 1994. And you were, you had been speaking a little while, but I think you were just starting to, to really take off. Yes. And, and the, during that time, and Jim, I, I met him years before that when he was with Best Land Products and mentored by a guy named Bill Bailey, uh, who was a, just a great influence in his life. And I admired Bill Bailey. I think he's one of the greatest motivational speakers that never got his just due. He was very powerful from Kentucky. And, and so, and a former pool shark. And so <laughs> I admired Bill Bailey and I admired Jim Rowan. And I, I, he was like a statesman. When the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. I remember when I was speaking in Malaysia and he was there and he was taking notes and, and I, I said, you know, one of the things I, I love so much of, about the quote, your life can either be a warning or an example, a warning of what not to do one example of what to do. And he was taking notes. I said, Jim, hold it. This is your stuff, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> because he took voracious notes. He was a guy who believed in ongoing education and he was always taking notes. He obviously believed that you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. You know, I got to spend quite a bit of time with Bill. Uh, I became his agent as well. Is that and, right? Yeah, and I published his book, uh, Rhythms of Life. Mm-hmm. And the biggest challenge I had with Bill, and I love him dearly, uh, he passed away, as you know. Yeah. But <clears throat> he, uh, he could get pretty crusty up on stage, right? And he had this little bit of, you know, the IRS and some things were, yeah. uh, and, and so it, it was a little tricky, but he was such a phenomenal guy. I'll never forget, we were in St. Louis. Jim was doing a two-day Bill came over from Kentucky and it was one of those older hotels where they had someone in the elevator that would take you up and down. Yeah. And the lady looked pretty rough, you know, missing some teeth, you know, just looked like she'd smoked, you know, four packs a day. <clears throat> and Bill looked at her and he started just talking to her and he said, you know, if the gods had been so kind, we would have in another lifetime, you know, had met and, and she just smiled so big. And, you know, that was the epitome uh, to me of Bill Bailey, just how 
uh, connected he could be, right? And just come yes. up with the most amazing things. A former Chicago pool shark, he said, <laughs> he agreed with Winston Churchill, just because you kill a man, don't mean you disrespect him. Don't step over his body, walk around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many, right? <clears throat> yes, yes. If you have, do you have any of his um, tapes? I probably do. Like yes, he please. sent me the original Growth into Greatness because we yes. were going to re-record it. And um, I, I did publish his book, Rhythms of Life. And there's probably a couple of those laying please. around somewhere. That's, I want that for my birthday. I, yeah. I okay. turned 75 February the 17th. So that's, that's my birthday gift from you to me. Thank you so very much. God will, bless you. We will have to celebrate because mine's February 16th and I turn 60. Is so that when right? you turn 75 the day before I turn 60. Yes, <laughs> so you're still in diapers. But let me, let me deliver those by hand. All right, very we'll good. Have, we'll have a, a celebratory drink. I got one last Bill Bailey story. Uh, before Jim Rohn passed away, he passed away December 6th, uh, 2009. And he had gotten really sick <clears throat> and I was putting together a tribute video and you were on it and Brian Tracy and Mark Victor Hansen and, you know, uh, Jim's best friends, his accountant, you name it, right? Ex-employees. <clears throat> the one guy that couldn't come was Bill Bailey and he didn't have the technology to, to, you know, to send us a video. So I got an airplane, flew to Lexington, rented a car drove to the old family log cabin. Mm -hmm. We spent the day together. I videoed him uh, for two hours. I think when they finally did the edits, 30 seconds made it. But I said, I can't, and I got to deliver this video to Jim a month before he died and we watched it. And he had been not estranged from a couple of people, but there are some people I'd mentioned, you probably would know who they are, that, you know, they hadn't talked in a long time. And both those people would just start crying when they talked about Jim and Jim would look at me and go, wow. And it was the greatest day I ever had with Jim. Mm -hmm. But I would say, I can't deliver this to Jim Rohn without Bill Bailey being on it. Right. Right. That's so right. that was the one guy I had to make sure I could get on it. And uh, mm, I know it was a special day, Les. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> he shared something. He said, Kyle, you know, we can't predict the future. Like, how could you have ever predicted you would work with Jim Rohn? Did you even know who he was? I'm like, no, I didn't know who Jim You're right. There's no way I could have known. And he said, you just have to let whatever your gift is make room for itself, right? You can't yes. predict. You can't make things happen. You just have to be the best at what you do and let that take you where it's going to go. Yes, absolutely. So 1994, uh, you were, you had had your PBS special, I believe you were yes. get, getting your own TV show. Things were taking off for you as a speaker was how long had you been speaking up in, at, up until that point? I, I started speaking. I've been speaking now 51 years. And, I, and, and so when I, when I think about it, they said, and I agree with it, that you were not born to work for a living but to live your making and living your making will make your living. And mm. I believe I was born to speak. I love it. And to train yes. speakers, that's what I do best. Yes. And, and so I've been doing it for quite a while and it has really impacted my life. I, I, I was surprised at the impact and the value of speaking that can have for people. The average speaker get around, according to the National Speakers Association, around 25 or 30 calls a year. Now it's getting over 3,000 a year. <laughs> right. And, and so, but it, what I love about speaking is that most people don't realize you get more out of it than they do. Mm. Mr. Washington, who the high school teacher that I told you about, he said, love, hope, and inspiration are perfumes you can't sprinkle on others without getting a few drops on yourself. Mm. And I always felt when I speak, that I leave there stronger, better, and more powerful because I was sharing with people a message that I needed to hear because we give a message out of our mess. You know, Les, uh, you're, you are so generous from stage and connecting with the audience. And I know you come and you bring it and you share and 
so I, I want to ask you a question that, you know, I, I don't want to put you in an awkward position when I want you to not necessarily brag about yourself, but when you've accomplished the mastery you've accomplished, I mean, you've done this, your 10,000 hours, and then many more, and you're masterful, right? You get less brown. Like I was at an event and the crowd was kind of hostile because the promoter had messed up. And then finally, here comes Les Brown at the end of the day. And you saved the day. And it was mastery, right? Mm -hmm. And from that would be, I think, that would make us all feel good. But coming from some of the difficult situations you, you came from, knowing many of the people you grew up with, you know, things didn't necessarily work out for them. How does it make you feel now to be on the other side of this, knowing that you have mastered, uh, a, you know, something that puts you in this elite air? It's, it's a humbling experience because in my estimation of myself, and I'm not a modest person, I would rate myself as a six in terms of speaking. Okay. Yes. And, and, and I'm not a modest person by no stretch of the imagination. I love the two top guys that I love that I considered masters was Earl Nightingale because of his, of his grasp of quotes, he's well informed, of Jim Rowan because of in, insight and he spoke like a statesman. And to me, the gift that he had was a gifted speaker is a person who can make a few words go a long way. and. I admire those two more than any of the others. I, I, I love Zig Ziglar, his enthusiasm, but I didn't listen to him much because I don't want to pick up that Mississippi twang. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I have fun. You know, they, they say a calling is something that you do it so much, you do it for nothing. Hmm. But you do it so well that people will pay you to do it. I have fun. And, and what I see that I brought in the industry that has been successful for me. The industry has been based upon the philosophy of the tell Dale Carnegie course. Tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. My mentor, Mike Williams, who wrote the book, The Road to Your Best Stuff. The Road to Your Best Stuff. Mike said, Brownie, never let what you wanna say get in the way of what your audience wants to hear. Wow. Always conduct communications intelligence. So he taught me how to speak extemporaneously. So I always sent out needs assessment. And then I came in and I would interview them for at least an hour to two hours before I spoke. And I then put my speech together there. And that just shocked them because most of the speakers come in with their memorized speech, <laughs> right. drop it and then go to the next city. But the other thing that I did, that most people were speaking with the exception of, of Jim and, and Earl Nightingale from the Dale Kern, from the Earl, no, it was from Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. And they gave information if information could change people, everybody would be skinny, rich, and happy. Right. <laughs> okay. right. So I came with stories. My story, a story about me, about my mother, and a story has a human face, and it touches a person hard. So, the, so I use stories to expand a person's mind, to touch their heart, and to ignite their spirit. And, and I, that was my success, finding out what people wanted to hear, custom designing it to meet those expectations and exceed them and orchestrate an experience with a story. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. So I have focused on creating a significant emotional event. And that was my success. And so when I put Jim in there, that took her to another level. And I had Earl Nightingale, I would quote her. And, th and those are the two guys that I studied the most in this industry, I tr attribute to my success because of the fact of the depth they studied. They were not just scripted guys, they studied. 
and you could learn so much from them every time you heard them. And I hear you saying that you were a student. You want it to learn. You want it to be the best. You want it to craft your, you know, hone your craft, right? Yes. And instead of, because again, you already had a, a quick following, but you were still studying and learning. And yeah, everyone brings a little read something two books different. a month. Uh, oh, wow. I heard something by Brian Tracy. He said the average American reads one book a year. And he said, if you discipline yourself to read one book a month, in five years, you've read 60 books, the average American would have read one book that will make you an expert. Well, I took that seriously. So I disciplined myself to read between three to five books a month. And, and, and with that, plus the research that I did on corporations like AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, General Electric, IBM, Xerox, it allowed me to break through to speak for corporations. That's where the majority, 80% of my speaking that I have done over the years. And, and had I not become a perpetual student, as I, I still do it now, but it's a habit that I enjoy very much, I don't think I would have been as successful with just one memorized speech. Uh, I remember going on a tour with Zig and we were speaking for Sprint. And so the president of Sprint said, look, said some of these people have seen you two and three times. Zig, you need to get a new speech. And Zig said, no, you need to get a new audience. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Jim had had similar, you know, he had his speech, right? And, yes. Uh, and it was difficult sometimes if if they wanted less time for him to take less time. And we have some stories on that. We Because he couldn't edit it down in real time. Yeah, yeah. and he apologized to me years later because we, uh, I got him on the Peter Lowe tour and finally after about the 6-1 of him going 45 minutes over and Margaret Thatcher being late and George Bush being late, right? They said, it's got to be an hour. And he went extra long that time because Jim was over <laughs> the Maverick, right? <clears throat> uh, and 10 years later, he apologized. He said, you know, it's so easy now. If someone wants 45, I'll give them 45, right? Yes. But yeah. there for a while, it was... Because uh, he wanted all... to get it out. He was so full. Yeah. He studied. And he was so committed to transforming people's lives. Yeah. He, he was driven by not just giving a presentation, but by transforming an audience individually and collectively. And so he put a lot of thinking into the work that he did and he could reach anybody that could hear him. A thousand percent. And I, again, part of the message to a speaker is you got to find what works for you, right? Yes. And I know you have so many tools and you work with a ton of speakers and you have programs. And so, and I watch you use your tools. And I, when I've heard you uh, on Sean, uh, on Sean's podcast or, or on Sean's interview, uh, my good friend, uh, and uh, just you, everything you said had strategy behind it. And it was just showed the brilliance. Having said all that, though, the uh, being authentic, does anything, is, would that be number one if you're a speaker, if you're talking to an audience, no matter how many tools yes. you have, no matter, like with Jim, he had a talk, but he also was authentic, right? He just showed up, you knew who he was, he, he wasn't trying to be someone he wasn't, take yes. him or leave him. Who he, have, who he was on stage, that's who he was off the stage. Yes. And, and so... And that's very important. I, I think that what's important also is being transparent. When people, in, in my book, you've got to be hungry. When they get to the last two chapters, they said that caught them by a surprise and, and they were shocked because I talk about the fact that we're three-dimensional. We have a, a public life, we have a private life, and we have a secret life. And I want to share with you my secret life. When people read that, they're like, whoa, my God, I've never read anything like this before. Yeah. Because usually, and, and, and the other thing that I decided to do, that 
most of the speakers talk about here are the things and what it takes to become successful. I talk about what it takes to become successful, but I also spend a lot of time in how life kicked my butt and the mistakes that I made. And if I had it to do over again, this was what I would do differently. And so by being transparent, I remember when I spoke on stage in San Francisco and I talk about the fact that when I went through a divorce, that for a period of time, I couldn't get on stage. I was ashamed that how can I talk about success? And success is more than just earning money or acquiring materialistic things. It's about being a good father, being a good husband, and, and, and growing a family and making that work. And I failed at that. And so I said, but I wasn't a failure. I failed at that. And there was a lady who had been a marriage counselor for like 20 years and she stopped because she went through a divorce. And she said she loved providing counseling for couples, but she felt that she couldn't do it anymore because she couldn't make her marriage successful. And she went back because of my transparency. She realized that that career for her was not over, that she failed in that marriage, but it was not her, she was not a failure and she can still have something of value that she can provide for people. Yeah, it's such a challenge, right? Uh, for oh, us yeah. all to, and, and everyone's got a common experience, right? It all looks different for each person, mm -hmm. um, but, that, but that's powerful less. What would you say uh, in all the years of being a speaker or a couple of the hardest lessons you've had to learn? You can't help everybody. Mm. They, I wish I had read the book by Alan Dushman called Change or Die, scientifically proven that nine out of 10 people would rather die than change. Mm. They had these patients who were in the cardiology ward and they were told if you, if you have a support group and you have a plant-based diet and you minimize stress in your life, and follow the instructions we give you, you will not have a recurring heart attack because if you do, it will kill you. And they knew that because it had several heart attacks. And so now they were at the end of the road. And within 90 days, nine out of 10 went back to eating meat, to not minimizing the stress with meditation and recreation and, and, and not getting the coaching to help them to navigate this thing called life. You can't see the picture when you're in the frame and, and they died. And so that people have to come to a place where they love themselves enough to put in the work. It's work to decide that I'm not going to allow my circumstances where I am what I'm going through rather than just go through it. I'm going to grow through it. The things that happen to me, I have the opportunity to say it has happened to me and position myself as the victim, or I can say this has happened for me and find some goodness in it, find some way that I can grow from it mentally and emotionally and spiritually and become a better person because of that experience. You know, and you touch on a good point. I know you've been through cancer a few times, right? I'm a 27-year prostate cancer <laughs> conqueror. I'm dealing with fourth-stage cancer. As I talk to you, oh, under my the goodness. of the Cancer Centers of America and <laughs> Dr. Taha, <laughs> he said, you know, you've been dealing with fourth-stage for a while. I said, yes. And cancer metastasized to seven areas of your body. I said, yes. He said, why are you smiling? I said, because seven is my lucky number. <laughs> I said, I wanted seven children. I was born February the 17th. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. Naaman dipped himself in the river seven times. Seven is my lucky number. He told his secretary, he said, this is a strange one here. <laughs> Yes. Well, well Les, yes. I got to I gotta tell you, you look as good as I've seen you and sound as good of, as I've heard you. And I, so do you feel like you have made some positive changes that is helping? 
like maybe meditation or nutrition? Oh, meditation, prayer, um, upgrading your relationships, having a, a, a mindset that whatever you are dealing with, that it has not come to stay, it has come to pass, just like what we're going through right now. And what's the good in it? What is it that I can discover about myself? I think there are four main questions that we have to answer. Number one, who am I? Number two, why am I here? Three, where am I going? And four, who's going with me? Mm. And when you answer those questions, it allows you to handle the storms of life and they're going to come. You know, Viktor Frankl calls it unavoidable suffering. The book of life says, think it not strange that you're faced to fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might, you will have tribulations. And so those things are, are there to test you, no test, no testimony, that they, they'll bring a strength out of you. They'll introduce you to a part of yourself that you don't know. And, and I think that's why Viktor Frankl said that adversity introduces a man to himself. Wow. So I, I know this would apply to you. I feel like it applies to me. It applies to so many people that have had challenges, right? They've dealt, dealt with stuff, some of it self-imposed, some of it from the outside. Uh, do you think that is just part, uh, uh, just the common experience? Or you'll hear some people say people that have big callings, have bigger challenges, or is it just really just the common experience for everyone? It's a common experience. Everybody's going to get their butts kicked. I don't I care who you are. are. You can tithe. You can be cute. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a motivational speaker. You can think positive and be enthusiastic. Everybody's going to kick their get their butts kicked. You know, Forrest Gump said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I'll never forget when Dr. Olson, a top oncologist, in Washington, D.C., when he diagnosed me with prostate cancer, he said, Mr. Brown, you have prostate cancer and your PSA. I said, what does that stand for? He said, it, it stands for prostate-specific antigen. He said, it's 2,400. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, one to four is normal. I said, can I get a second opinion? He said, yes. <laughs> and you're ugly, too. Said, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, man, what are you saying? <laughs> nice. And then he stopped and said, but you got this. You got this. He said, we determine the diagnosis. God determines the prognosis. You got this. Hmm. And he had for people like me who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, he had, he had a collection of watches that had no hands on them. And he said, I said, well, what, why would you give me this? It has no hand on it. He said, because when you look at this, you determine how long you're going to be here. We determine wow. the diagnosis, you determine the prognosis. And I said, wow. And it, it helped me to trigger my thinking that I played a role, that it, this is a partnership, that hmm. it's like when you think about Bruce Lipton, the biology of belief, that I believe that I have a calling, that there's something for me to do. And that I must be about my father's business. And we're all going to leave here. Nobody's figured out how to get out of here alive. But people, studies indicate, who have a sense of purpose and direction and, and a meaning for their lives, they, they live here longer than people who have no reason to get up in the morning. People have a reason to get up in the morning. They don't need an alarm clock. They get up automatically. I don't use an alarm clock. <laughs> Love that. So digging a little deeper here, so uh, cancer, I mean, that this is the real deal. This is stuff that, you know, uh, have you, and you've been dealing with it off and on, you know, for a long time, as you said. Yes, 27 years. What, are there anything, things the last six months, the last two years, the last five years that have really become clear to you? that it's like, now you get it. It's like, okay, I don't know why I didn't see that two years ago. I didn't see that six months ago, but you get it now. Um, I've been on a path that I did not know how I knew, but I knew it was the right path. And I got confirmation in the movie 
by the gentleman who was on the front of Time Magazine in the wheelchair. You know who I'm talking about? He died a few months ago. He was terrible. Yeah, Stephen Hawkins, maybe? Stephen Hawkins. When, mm -hmm. he was, when he was told that he had a crippling disease, he asked the question, what about my mind? And the guy said, it won't affect your mind. And he said, then I'll be good. Yeah. I'll be good. And so if I had to talk to the 23-year-old Les Brown, I would say, no matter what you do, invest in your mind. You don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. You can use your ability to walk, to move. This guy didn't have any of the things that we take for granted, like picking up a glass of water yeah. and drinking. Couldn't take himself to the bathroom. Married three times and was a brilliant mind, a brilliant mind. Couldn't speak audibly, had to speak through a machine, but he had his mind. There's nothing as powerful and that's, that, that means more to us because if you don't have that, you have nothing. Hmm. In nutrition and meditation, those things do play a role. Yes, absolutely. I have a plant-based diet. I exercise. I, I walk 10,000 steps a day. Yes, all of those things play a role. But this guy, didn't, he couldn't walk 10,000 steps yeah. a day. He couldn't walk one step. He was just all bundled up in a wheelchair, and he had his mind. I saw the movie three times. I read his books, and I, because I wanted to know how could the average person with that type of crippling disease die around 21, 22, but he lived to be around 72. What was it? And it was mental resolve. And that, to me, is the key to achieving the things that you want to achieve in life because you're going to fail your way to success. You're going to have more failures than successes. Walt Disney, he filed bankruptcy seven times and had two nervous breakdowns. And Walter P. Chrysler, he fought, failed 49 times in the automobile industry, but he would not give up. As you know, Henry Ford was called an ignoramus, but he would not give up. 86% of people, when they encounter their first failure, they quit. And so, but there are people who are hungry, who are determined, who will, who will find a way to win, who will say, I'm going to do this anyhow, because this is who I am, this is what I want, and I'm not going to stop until I get it. And so my philosophy is, you're going after something, get ready for the fight. It, it, it's going to be a battle for you. If you do what is easy, like quit, <laughs> If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. Even a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when I think of Les Brown, I think of you got to be hungry, right? Yes. And I think about goal setting. You talk a lot about goals. Uh, when you were just sharing, it reminded me of the DJ story. Yes. I have a book I did called 52 Lessons I Learned from uh, Jim Rohn and other legends, I promote it. And I tell the DJ story uh, about you in the, in the book. Do you mind sharing that? Because that's a classic case of being hungry, being prepared, being hungry, and having a goal. Yeah. This high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, he told me there were three things that you need to amplify in your life. Number one, he said, develop your mind. And you don't get in with life what you want, you get in life what you are. Two, he said, practice OQP, only quality people. Mm. And three, he said, develop your communication skills. Because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. Mm. And I wanted to go into radio. And, and I told him that I wanted to become a disc jockey. And so he said to me, he said, Mr. Brown, he said, I want you to go to WMBM radio station. See Milton Butterball Smith and tell him I sent you. And so I went to WMBM radio station on Miami Beach. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball. My name is Les Brown. I'd like to become a disc jockey. He said, do you have any journalism in your background? I said, no, sir, I don't. Do you have any experience? I said, no, sir, I don't. But I've been practicing. Let me audition for you. He says, no, we don't have any job for you. And I was dis disappointed. I went back and I told Mr. Washington. I said, he said, no. He said, don't worry about it. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you got to be hungry. Go back again. I went back again. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you? 
my name is Les Brown, sir. I like to become a disc jockey. He said, weren't you here yesterday? I said, yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? I said, yes, sir, you did. He said, then why are you back today? I said, I don't know whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. Nobody was laid off or fired. Now, get on out of here. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here yesterday? I said, yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? I said, yes, sir. He said, then why are you back today? I said, I don't know whether or not somebody was, was sick or somebody died, sir. He said, no one was sick or died. No one was laid off or fired. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day looking happy, talking loud, like I was singing for the first time. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. And I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I believe you give before you ask. I'd go get their lunch and their dinner. And I stood in the control room watching them, working their hands on the control board, knowing my time would come. People that are hungry, expect to win. People that are hungry believe it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And so on the weekends, when they would come out to the parking lot, their cars would be waxed and clean inside out. And they said, hey, who did this? I did, sir. How much do you charge, young fella? Nothing, sir. I just, I just wanted to help out. And they said, wow. Listen, Donna Ross and the Supremes are coming to town. The Four Tops and the Temptations. Here are my car keys. Pick them up and drive them to the Fountain Blue Hotel on Miami Beach. I said, it'd be my pleasure, sir. I would drive the big, long Cadillacs all over Miami Beach with these entertainers. Didn't have any driver's license, but I was driving like I had so. <laughs> <laughs> and then one Saturday afternoon, a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air and he began to slur his words and I knew he could not complete his show and I was watching him through the control room window rocking back and forth saying drink rock drink <laughs> young ready and hungry and then the general manager called I said hello he said young boy this is Mr. Klein I said hello sir he said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, call one of the other DJs and have them to come in. I said, yes, sir. I hung up and I waited for about 20 minutes. I called my mother and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn on the radio. I'm about to come on the air. <laughs> I called him back. I said, Mr. Clyde, I can't find nobody. He said, do you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get rock out of the way. And I came on there. I said, look out. This is me, LB, Triple P, Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only, young and single and love to mingle, certified, modified, and indubitably qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby. I'm your love man. I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Love that story. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. And did that lead to a job? I got the job. <laughs> wow. So I cool. I did it for about nine years. And then wow. I went from there to the Ohio legislature, passed 14 bills my first term. Mm -hmm. The chairman of the Human Resource Committee and Education Committee. I was planning on running for the Senate and then Congress and statewide office. Then my mother became ill. I resigned and went back to Miami to take care of her and got back into um, working to become a motivational speaker. You know, Les, I uh, love that story. Uh, Saturday, when you were with Sean Murphy uh, on, on his interview, you guys really got into the speaking side of things and the power we have to influence other people with our words Yes. And who we are, it, you know, partly it's our words, but even more important, it's what's behind our words. And at this stage of your life and career, I know you just want to impact as many other people to go out and impact people. I know Jim Rohn would tell me my goal is to impact the few that have, uh, impact the many, right? And I know that you have so many people you've mentored. 
what would you say to the audience, whether they want to be a speaker, whether they're a leader with inside their company, whatever it may be to have more influence? There's no question. The number one key to having more influence is your ability to communicate. Mm. Your ability to expand a person's vision beyond their mental conditioning, to touch their hearts because we're emotional people, and to ignite their spirits. Most people don't know enough about themselves to be a cynic. And so you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. When you're able to communicate you can take a person to a place within themselves that they can't go by themselves. And so spending the time, one, to be the message that you bring. I work first on the messenger and then on the message. There are a lot of people speaking, but they haven't done anything. They have not living, lived a, an achievement-driven life. And so I think it's very important that you not just practice what you preach, but you preach what you practice. Mm -hmm. And and as you look at yourself and look, you go, look at your goals, you said something very key. Who you are behind the words are far more important than the words that you speak. And that comes through the spirit of your speaking. You live an achievement-driven life. You've been in this industry because it's in you. It's, it's your calling. And, and as a result of that, you will achieve things that others will not achieve because it's not work. It's a passion. It's, it's, it's who you are. And so uh, speaking, you can literally save lives. I had a guy come to me. I spoke at a stadium in Poland. And at the end, he just came to me and, and, and he put a bullet in my hand. And he says, thank you so much from me from my wife and from my children. My life is in a dark place. I was planning on taking my life and someone gave me a cassette tape of yours and I heard you say life is God's gift to us and how we live our lives is our gift to God and you've got to be hungry to achieve your goals. And I decided not to kill myself. He said, take this. And we both broke down and started crying. You know? <laughs> so it was quite an experience. It was a humbling experience that we have the ability, and especially now, we are dealers of hope when there's hope in the future that gives you power in the present. When people have been had the rug snatched out from under them in a very short time and never see it coming, and then I talked to a friend today and she took her husband to the hospital. When she drove into the parking lot, the, the, the desk was in the parking lot to receive him. And then they had to walk over to a tent where they bought a wheelchair out. And she thought she was gonna accompany him into the hospital. Says, no, you can't go. And the person, she said, was looked like they were from out of space with all the, the, the mask and the gear and the goggles and everything they had on all the way down to the feet. And when he went in, that was the last time she saw her husband. When she spoke to him on the phone, he said, I don't know if I'll be able to make it. And that night, he died, and two days later, he was cremated. There was no funeral. He was cremated. So she did not have a chance to say goodbye. He died in the room by himself. No family there. That's happening all over the world yeah. right now. And so, when, when people go going through this kind of experience, they need some healing words, words that can let them know, this has not come to stay, it has come to pass. The words of St. Francis, God give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can. 
and the wisdom to know the difference. And so I asked her, I said, I don't want to ask you how you feel. I just want to ask you what's next. What's next? And she said, what do you mean? I said, he's gone. They've cremated him. He's gone. What are you going to do next? What does your life look like? I wanted her to get out of her head and into the future and tell me how can I support you in that? And, and by creating that shift from where she was in the grief to thinking about how she was going to restructure and redirect her life, she still is going to have some time to grieve, but she's going to have a game plan and energy on her next move. My mother used to say an idle mind is a devil's workshop. Just sitting home and grieving about, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. We'll not bring him back. No. And it's not going to close the wound. But what will happen, and, and I gave her a piece of a poem that said, if you but knew where I stepped, you will wonder why you wept. Something to bring her comfort. That's what words do. That's what we do when we speak for people. We, we expand their vision beyond the grief, beyond the pain, and allow them to live in their heart. Where the heart is, there your treasure is also. Powerful. And as you begin sharing that, uh, a big part of the essence is when people want to be a speaker to work as much on themselves as they do their craft. It's, yes. It's, it's an equal balance. I'm still working on myself. I've got two books I've got to finish before the end of the month that I've given myself because as, as soon as your audience know as much as you know, they no, no longer need you. You have to stay ahead. And, and then I just love it. I love to read and I love stories. I, I say the best speakers are the best listeners. And, and, the, and, I, and, and I like the fact that Mike Williams taught me, never let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience wants to hear. And so I enjoy the, the challenge of going into a room of strangers that I've done research on them and to bring them together and allow them to get a, an expanded vision of what's possible for their lives and to act on that new vision. You know, uh, there's the analogy of turning the radio dial, right? So we're watching the news, we're watching TV, we're watching a, you know, a mindless sitcom or whatever, and then you find some Les Brown, you know, or some Earl Nottingale or some Jim Rohn. And I don't know why it's so powerful, but it is. Is that just you and me and the people in this world? Or do you think that's a common for most people? They just don't turn to the channel enough. And at what point in time have you ever felt like maybe you didn't need that? Did you back off of feeling that you needed to still listen to some Earl Nottingale occasionally or whoever it is? And have you come back full circle on that? I, I had a period when life knocked me senseless. When I was going through divorce, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. My best friend died waiting on a liver transplant and my mother died. And my son, John Leslie came in my room, he was 10. And he said, daddy, I said, yes. He said, are you going to die? I said, John Leslie, we're all going to die one day. He says, no, I need to know. Are you dying soon from this cancer? I said, why would you ask me that question? He said, I don't hear any words coming through the doors, any motivational messages. The room is dark. The shade is down. Where's my daddy? Oh. I just want to know where he is. Is he still here? Or is he in a slow process of dying? Will you fight? I said, yes, I will fight. Yes, I'm so glad you asked me that. Yes, I'm going to fight. And then he went over and he let the shade up. And he said, who do you want to listen to? 
I said, I think I need to listen to myself today. Put on the George Les Brown speaking to the George <laughs> Doe. <laughs> I need to listen to my own words right now. <laughs> And he said, good, and come out of this room. <laughs> and I got back in the fight. But sometimes life can knock you silly where you can't think. And, you know, in your industry, uh, people probably don't realize, I, I obviously uh, understand how difficult it is to be the content creator, mm -hmm. me looking from the outside in, the con you're the content creator, you're the content presenter, but then you still got to run the business. Yes. And then you have to run a team, right? And then you have this throng of people that look to you and, you know, innocently enough, but they, you know, they, they're, they're, they, they're wanting to pull something from you, right? Oftentimes. Yes. yes. And how, uh, and that's not easy, right? That that's difficult, no, especially if you hire family. Like, <laughs> oh my God! Let me no, tell you something. It is one of the biggest challenges, Everybody right? I tell the young Les Brown, don't hire your family <laughs> <laughs> because they don't know what they don't know, and they think they know. And it takes a minute. If there's no substitute for experience. Your name and reputation is all that you have. And you work hard for that. You know, God said to Abraham, I'll make your name great. He didn't say, I'll make you a great man. He said, I'll make your name great. Mm -hmm. Reputation is everything. And the only reason that I'm still standing, I don't know the business and my kids don't know, fortunately, I have people who grew up with my words in their head who are now coaching and training my kids because I couldn't be the business leader and the speaker. Those are two different mindsets. I, I needed a Carl Wilson in my life. Jim was very blessed to have you because you, you knew how to guide his life and how to get more out of his career than he can get it himself. And so fortunately at this stage of my life, I'm still here and I get a chance to watch my kids mature now and, and people who are taking care of them and teaching them things that they need to know, how they can leverage my name and legacy, but also build a name and legacy for themselves. The major key that we are to do is to teach people how to create and live a life that will outlive them. That's what we're supposed to do as speakers. And it's not easy with family, but it's possible. And it's nope. necessary. Yeah, so and powerful. It's, and it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've always said, uh, you know, for 20 plus years, a lot of the bigger name speakers weren't necessarily the best speakers. They were good marketers, right? Yes. And they... But, you know, I look at you, I look at Jim, I think you guys are some of the most talented speakers, right? And that's where, yeah, it does help to have a trusted business relationship. And mm -hmm. those are hard to come by. I, you know, yes. uh, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting business. And it's the same way with music. It's the same way in other industries too. Um, but you've done quite well, Les. You've created so much product, so, you know, so many books and filled up so many huge rooms. So you've done a masterful job with it, but I know it's difficult, right? To have all those different hats. Yes. I've done it in spite of, in spite of all my shortcomings, in spite of all the knowledge and expertise that I did not have, in spite of not having the marketing and the level of professionalism and customer service. I was very fortunate. I've been very fortunate. Yeah, I don't encourage anybody to do it like that. <laughs> well, I, again, it's a dilemma. It, it's hard. Like, I don't think there's too many of me's around. And I think on the, the flip side, you know, um, the, the, the talent you had, the talent Jim had rose above the challenges in the marketplace, right. To, to have to, uh, 
yeah, no, you, you're, you're your own rainmaker, but then it's the habit to keep up with it all, right? So you were the speaker, yes, you were the author, burn. and you yeah. were the rainmaker, and it's, but then there's, I had someone to manage it all, right? $150,000 from me last year. I had somebody, uh, the most I've ever had embezzled from me was $840,000. Wow. Yeah, because we're on the road. Yeah. And, and so you can't watch your own back. You have to trust yeah. somebody. And I remember trying to work a deal with you and we had an argument about you don't sign agreements. Oh, really? That okay. Handshake that, okay. That, that was the old fashioned way. And I said, this is crazy. <laughs> agreement is good as the paper is written on. Well, if a person is not a person of integrity, even if they sign the paper, they won't come through. Yeah. But because you operated from a place of integrity and all the years in this business, you're one of the few people that I've never heard not one negative word about you not honoring your word as yourself. Wow. Wow. Judge a man not by what he does, but what he does that he doesn't have to do. And to judge the true quality of a man is what he does when no one's looking. Wow. And I just want to applaud you for your integrity. Thank you, Les. Uh, yeah, Jim and I had a handshake for 10 years mm -hmm. and we finally needed to button it up. We did it on one page because I got concerned if something happened to me. And I'm like, if something happened to me, I want to give the company to my team and they pay Jim and it not go to someone, maybe his family that wouldn't have known how to manage the company, right? And so yes. I'm like, we need to button this up and, and then I'll get an insurance policy. So I don't want anything from it. If yes. something happened to me, my family's got an insurance policy, but I just, so we finally did it. But after that, I mean, of course you have to have an agreement. Yeah. But at the time, I don't know what was going on there, uh, why we, I was going down the handshake road, but I think, um, you know, it got down to this ultimate philosophy of it all gets down to bringing value, right? It's like, if I don't bring value, you're not going to want me, right? Yeah, but and, it's also, it's about honoring your word as yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you knew you were going to do that and you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You had a lot going on at the time. You had the big show, you had kind of an entourage and I, so I don't know why we didn't quite pull it off, but uh, I, I knew so I was a big fan. Good. I, when I think about this journey, I, I, I say, there's a song called, Lord, if you don't do anything else for me, you've done enough. Yeah. I have lived a blessed life, and I'm thankful, and I'm very grateful for people like you, for people like Jim, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Dennis Waitley, and so many others who, who they were the road blazers and they set the stage for Les Brown. And I'm grateful. Whenever you know I what, go on Les, stage, you I'm are grateful. the road blazer for so many other people, right? Mm -hmm. Think of you, you were the guy, right? You were the, the probably the first African American speaker, right? To take off and be on the big stages. And so you have, uh, you know, blaze the trail for so many people. Yeah, I have, that's what they tell me. They call me the old man now. <laughs> I said, I'm 75, I guess. <laughs> I served at the Lord's Supper. <laughs> well, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back memory lane, um, a little self-indulgent, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm sorry for our listeners. But for me, I, I, I'll never forget having dinner with you and Gladys and Billy Preston and mm -hmm. then we did a series of events uh, that you wanted to bring motivation and music. And yes. so Billy would play. And I remember we were doing uh, an event in LA and he had to have an organ and there was only one of those organs in all of Southern California. So yes. we finally hunted it down and found it. But that is such an amazing memory. You know, Les Brown and Billy Preston, uh, in front and of a right is my yes, and yeah. man, and he could play that organ. Oh my goodness, he was a master at that. He 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 owned the organ. Yes, he did. Yes, and he played with some of the greats. I I, I heard a guy today that I had not heard. I've, I, he was before my time. 
the, the most charismatic old performers was Cab Calloway. From here, from Cab Calloway, it came Little Richard. Billy Preston worked with Little Richard wow. all around the world and the Beatles. Right. And then from, from Little Richard, then came James Brown. <laughs> and, you know, I feel good. You know, it, it, so when I think about what I've had a chance to see and, and people I've had to work with as a disc jockey and then as a, as a speaker behind stage and as a presenter of concerts, I booked the Jackson Five when Michael Jackson was 10 years old. Wow. That being here for 75 years, I've seen a thing or two. <laughs> Therefore, I do a thing or two. I am so grateful and so blessed. And, and that's why I feel we live in the greatest country in the world that gives us an opportunity to use our talents, to pursue our dreams, and to have experiences that can you can rarely find any place else on the planet. Love that. So uh, I know we're about to wrap it up, but just a couple more questions. Do you have time? Yes. Um, just thinking about where you came from, right? When you, especially with all the challenges going on right now and people come to you and, you know, they, they do feel like the deck is stacked against them, but you have perspective, right? You've been around for a while. You've seen, uh, you know, you and I've been through a lot, you know, seen 9-11 and everything else, and then your unique background, you've had the deck really stacked against you. How do you balance empathizing with someone and letting them know, hey, I, I hear you, and you, you got a good point, but that's not going to help you. You know, the only thing that's going to help you is not be a victim. The only thing that's going to help you is to say, okay, now what? Like, how do you balance that? The stack is, the deck is stacked against you. There's no question about it. And in order to get out of where you are, you got to be hungry. Yeah. Jackie Robinson said, don't level the playing field. Just let me on the field and I'll level it myself. People that are hungry level the <clears throat> field. All they want is access in the game. Even though I didn't get an infomercial, when Toastmasters International selected the top five speakers in the world in 1992, they selected Robert Schuller, Paul Harvey, Leah Coker, General Norman Schwarzkopf, and myself. Mm. Not Tony Robbins, not Zig, not Jim, any of those dudes. I was in a very elite group. Yeah. Little cornbread me, labeled <laughs> educable, mentally retarded. This baby brows, baby boy. <laughs> and so I think that when you are hungry, your gifts will make room for you. Bring what you have. Mm. Do the best that you can, and God will do what you can't do. I believe that with everything in me. Love that. Is that like a gene that certain people have and certain people don't? Everybody has it. Okay. They just have to be in the right environment that nurtures and cultivates that or have an example that you see and say, whoa, that's me. I want to do that. And that was me when I saw Mr. Washington. And when he said, Booker T. Washington, not the largest, but the best. Oh, when you go out in life, operate out of the thinking of Henry David Thoreau. Do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. I said, I want to do that. I want to do that. Yes. So Les, if someone is interested in becoming a speaker, if someone's interested in being mentored by you, working up close with you, I know you, that's a big part of your focus. What? Yes, one-on-one -on -one with people who are ready to invest in themselves and who are serious and who are hungry and who want to master the art. Mm. Uh, they can email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com and just say, I'm hungry and I want to live a life that will outlive me. Those are the kind of people that I'm looking for. Okay, so email you and we'll put this in the show notes. 
Les yes, Brown, Les 77 Brown. at gmail.com and I'll put it in the show notes. And is there anything else you would want them to email you about? So the speaking? Uh, yeah, to speak, well, to teach them how to tell their story. We extract the story and we teach them how to deliver the story and how to create an experience with the story. And the other thing I encourage people to get my new book. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's my best work. It's my best work. You've got to be hungry. It's my best work. And it will transform their lives. My best and, work. And that's on audio book too, right? So they can Not go. Not yet. I will start recording tomorrow. Does that, do they go to Amazon to get the book? They can or? go to Amazon and put in, you've got to be hungry. Yes. I was Brown. Awesome. Wow. It's been such an honor, Les. Thank you oh, so I much for taking the time. Uh, man, you brought back a lot of memories for me. A lot of memories. I believe that Jim is here with us right now. Ooh, so you yes. two guys have done good. <laughs> yes. You made me proud. Hey, thank you so much, my friend. Don't, don't hang up yet. I, I want to ask you a question, but thanks so much. I encourage everyone to go reach out to Les to get his book for sure. But just think to be, to work. So the number one thing, Les, I hear, the number one thing I hear is I reg, people's greatest regret is that they never saw Jim Rohn live, right? They yeah. never took action. So uh, a chance to work with you. Oh my goodness. So guys, uh, I've never heard Les say that that often. Like this is, this is a moment in time where, yeah, not traveling to do speeches. Uh, so this is an opportunity to work with Les. So I, I encourage people to do it. Les, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, God bless you, my friend. Thank you, and God bless you. I wanted to tell you, I always wanted to open for Jim, and I was in London, England, and they invited me to speak, and Jim had already spoken, and I said, I've got to call the man up who has had such an impact on my life. And he was so honored. And as I honored him and talked about him and spoke, he, he cried. He was very emotional, mm -hmm. you know. He, he cried and he said, thank you, thank you. He said, I, I had no idea the impact that I made on you. And I said, yes, and we both held each other and cried. He was a great man. That's a special moment, you know. That Yes. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I, yes. I was, when I was with Dennis Waitley, he shared an Earl Nightingale story about them both seeing Jim in California speaking like in 19, way back when, way before Dennis ever recorded with Nightingale Kona. And so those stories just mean a lot to me. So thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Les, thank you so much. Uh, one of the great iconic speakers of all time, author. So we will talk to you soon, my friend. I appreciate you so much. You have something special, Kyle. You have greatness in you. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Love it. Thank you, Les. <laughs> Thank you.